to go through. But if any of you have a question, you can just ask it. Or if you have a topic you're passionate about, you can also just walk up here, uh, kick me out, sit down, and, and uh, leave the topic. Um, but if you don't even want to speak up, you can also submit a question on the Slido, and uh, we'll try to, to take it in. I have to apologize in advance. Uh, somehow I've been scheduled for two different panels that overlap with each other. So I have to leave at 12.30. So whoever is noisiest will take my place. Um, even though I said that we shouldn't be special, I think you guys should just introduce yourself like in a one sentence. And whoever comes here should do the same. So Leo, you, maybe you want to start? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Leo. I work on and the Solidity Compiler with the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, I'm Nick Johnson, formerly GIF core developer, now the lead of the ENS Ethereum service. Uh, hi, I'm Jock, and uh, I work on Viper. And, um, yeah. uh, hi, I'm Pablo, I work on, I mostly do EVM. Hi, I'm Alex, I'm working on Solidity and EWASM. I'm Casey, I'm also working on EWASM. All right, let's jump in to some of these questions. Maybe start with a, a big one, <laughs> which is... Uh, Store. Hmm? Store. No, pricing of computational and arithmetic opcodes. That has been, I think you can start at Pavel today, the discussion with EVM1 and optimizations. I'm not sure if any of you guys have seen that talk earlier today. Um, but there was also a paper out that some instructions may be mispriced. Um, and in the Istanbul hard fork, you may have seen EIP 1884, uh, which also suggests to, to repress a couple of instructions. So what, what do you guys think about instruction pricing? Is everything correct? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's... <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of impossible for it to be correct across all the machines. The best we can do is try and target an average machine, but with different resource constraints, with different speed SSDs, different RAM architectures, and so on, it's never going to be completely correct. We just have to try and arrive at a pricing scheme that isn't so far off base that it can, it's a subject to DOS attacks. Um, and, and that's why we have to do things like 1084 in order to avoid those, like leave the disruption to existing smart contracts is a problem, but it's an unavoidable one because the alternative is that we just sit with what we've got and then somebody figures out. Uh, a contract that's uh, costly enough to actually DOS is known to get like in Shanghai. Yeah, um, just to add to it, I think um, gas gas repricing is tough, but it has to happen. Um, and uh, I think it's also kind of where we want to go in the future of the project. I mean, depending on pre compiles, not pre compiles, and the adjustments we have to make to that. But what I also want to highlight is. We often say, well, we want neonative performance, and that's of course a goal, but we're also building a blockchain, so we should keep that in mind, that it's not always going to be neonative performance. And that's why we will have <coughs> certain functions that will be completely misplaced, but we want to do crypto in the event of the world. So I think that there are actually two problems here. Like most of the repricing that happened and the papers are about, and all of this is actually about like, accessing external data to EVM and like this is actually external to EVM at all. I mean it's just a way to, to read something from, from the outside, let's say disk or something like memory. And and I think this is what we mostly struggle with. Uh, on the on the other hand the computational outputs are kind of highly priced uh, comparing to the actually time it takes to execute them. So we have like big safe margin here. And I actually have a claim that even if we price the computational outputs by the same amount, all of them, it wouldn't matter because it's still so high comparing to the other costs that actually it's not exploitable. Uh, uh, so I mean, the the exp opcode was exploited, but uh, it's kind of it's I kind of algorithm instead of something uh, something more. Uh, so the worst worst case, I think they are. We have uh, quadratic opcodes that do multiplication and division, but still I think the margin is big enough and we are bounded by the big precision that 
it's not a big deal from the security point of view. But I think they could be could be priced lower if that helps. For example, to go to go more into a state that co uh, stateless contracts, so you can compute more instead of storing more. So it's said there's like a, the computational ones are, are highly overpriced today. And initially, I thought you you were also really happy with that because there's no risk. But now you say that uh, you would be happy to maybe lower them to to allow more computation. Yeah, so I, I personally would be would be like to, to lower them, uh, but I, well, we cannot price them accurately, like to each other. But they're, they're not like comp well. This other thing is they're not uh, in terms of uh, time they they take to execute and the prices. That's not also accurate at the moment. But somehow it's not exploitable uh, from the security point of view. Uh, but yeah, if we want more fair uh, prices, I think they should be definitely lowered by by some by by by, by, by big big margin. I mean, in the case of state modified opcodes, the, the reason for their cost isn't just execution time; it's also state load concerns. So if we yeah. reduce the cost, we make it proportionally cheaper to store more data. Um, so I think we need to balance that as well. Yeah, we're talking about reducing the cost of just the computational ones, right? Not the yeah, S-load, S-store. Yeah, we're talking about reducing the cost of S-store. No, no, Sorry, no. exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think we could have another question on that, actually. Yeah, yeah we actually have one on the, on the yeah. storage. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
yeah, very yeah. huge contracts. Yes, I've, I've recently deployed contract uh, which recalls RSA signature and costed like a lot of gas. <laughs> so I wasn't happy with that. <laughs> For deployment, you mean? Yeah. I think also the gas prices are very volatile. Sometimes it's like two gray is fine, sometimes you get 50 gray. And you can't predict beforehand what's the right time. Right? It's not that we can say cheaper than you can say more expensive or something like that. And that's very frustrating. Yeah, that's where EIP 1559 comes in. It's <laughs> I mean, I, I mean it's the gas market, right? Yeah, that, that's kind of what I maintain. We can improve the efficiency of, of the gas market effectively, but, but it's, it's always going to be highly inelastic because when you be below 100% capacity, it's as cheap as the miners are willing to accept. And once it hits 100% capacity, it shoots up to like the price that's high enough to make some people reconsider and not submit transactions. Would you like have something for forward contract or do you think just get these gases in the future? Is the way you yeah, come out of this market, you don't have to... <laughs> <laughs> I hate gas <laughs> the, the, pro the problem is that we, because because mining's permissionless, um, you, you can't really like sell a future and then be guaranteed you'll be able to redeem it. Uh, you know, the miner who is trying to redeem it might not be the miner that issued it and they have no reason to sort of accept that promise. Right. Uh, so nobody's come up with an incentive model that works for that, that that's actually effective. Uh, gas token works by exploiting a, a, an issue with the refund mechanics where you can basically force the miner to do twice as much work as you're paying them for. <laughs> um, but it's, it's not really scalable. Um, I mean, I kind of wonder if we should introduce a uh, an op code that does nothing but like consume gas and then later s return it to you because <laughs> it would be awful, but at least it wouldn't be wasting storage the way a gas token does. Yeah, I wish I was wearing my I was wearing my uh, <laughs> gas token t-shirt yesterday, <laughs> today. But it was the funny thing is that it was warned about in 2015 in the least authority um, you know report like analysis before Ethereum launched and. But, well, the way they warned about it was minor versus minor storage bombs, and it's not exactly um, what gas token is, but it has the same effect of <laughs> the storage. So, if I can ask the question, should we just would it make sense to just do away with gas storage bombs? Are they effective at what they're designed for? Yeah. And do they do more damage than they? No. What's the data on? Well, gas token makes sense, but we wouldn't yeah. know the natural use of. The I mean, no, they force the company. Yeah, I mean, broadly, the intention is to incentivize uh, deletion of data. Yeah. But I think it's a very, I don't have hard data, but I think it's very weak uh, incentive at that. It, it, it may be almost completely ineffective, in which case maybe it does more harm than good. Um, also, so somewhat related is the question is like, um, we say that if we have stateless, so then yes, if we have a stateless mode, then sure, on that layer we can maybe price the gas differently, but whoever is doing the execution environment is going to have the same storage problem, as pricing problem, correct? Right? Are you mixing with me to the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he mentioned I mentioned, uh, <laughs> he I mentioned. I mentioned stateless uh, contracts, so that's okay. mean, like you can design your contract uh, in a way, oh, I see, I see. it trade-offs uh, okay, yeah, so storage sorry. for computation. Right, right, so, right. right. Well, a good yeah. example of that is Funfair's fake channels. They just store a single hash for each channel on chain, and any time you want to make a change to the channel, you have to submit the entire struct and the hashes and the first. Yes. And they right. save a great deal of gas. Um, for that matter, uh, ENS's uh, uh, DNS set oracle does the same thing. We only store the hash of the DNS records because there's no reason to store the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and I think that cut our gas consumption by more than half. Yeah, um, uh, one of the contract note on that is uh, you could also like use incentives to do heavy calculations. Um, but kind of if you have like a two-party system that does trading or something and you have a formula that, that, that derives the middle point, uh, both parties on both sides actually have incentives to calculate the closest value and you could actually cache that value on storage and then make them constantly submit transactions to get the actual value. So yeah, there's, there's a few interesting stateless uh, things you can do. So I think in the DNSSEC Oracle, you, you said that yeah, you submit all the data needed to just uh, arrive at the hash. How big is the data you're submitting? Um, on the order of, probably of less than a kilobyte per, per entry, basically. Um, in fact, I'd say like 512 bytes is the maximum size for DNS entry. Um, and so you, 
you know, you submit a record that contains a, a public key and it verifies that against the, the thing that it's signed with and then stores the hash of that and then when you want to submit the next one with the sign of that key, you submit that and you submit the previous record, verifies the hash and then and so on. So you sort of chain it in that case. But it's it's not a lot of data, but storage is very expensive um, and it's a lot cheaper to pass it in twice via call data than it is once via call data and store it forever. And we kind of have to size that if you do have a lot of data you need to pass in and you need to do a certain amount of uh, computation on them to arrive to the state you, you store, there's like a trade-off where it is way cheaper to store stuff on meat point. I think it depends on the computation. So in this case, I mean, well, I guess obviously, but in, in this case, um, when you're passing in the redundant data, the only computation you have to do is a single kick act to some soft code over it to verify that it's the same as was passed in and verified last time. So we're not repeating a lot of computation because that verification is only done once. Um, and therefore, you know, it's, it works out cheaper. So I guess too bad for a panel that your use case works well. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the issue is when there when it requires Merkle proofs, because then all that Merkle data is what makes the call data um, possible. Of. But it's interesting you said um, currently just passing in, you know, just that, uh, uh, just the DNS data, it's half the cost of I, I storage. I it's pretty cheap, but it's on the order of half the cost. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's about to be, you know, four times cheaper yeah. after Istanbul, right? So I suspect most of the remaining cost is our computation cost, so it may not have as big an impact, but we'll definitely reduce it further. Um, do, do we still need ERC, uh, the code deposit limit? I think it's ERC 170 or so? Because I... You mean the uh, contract size limit? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, exactly. Because I, I saw some discussion on the ETH Magician forum that there is some debate uh, and I see more and more developing into this limit and this is really needed. So the problem is that there's, uh, when you start executing a smart contract, you have to load the whole thing off disk and also do some basic jump test analysis for the whole thing. And if the size of that is unbounded, then somebody can submit a very large contract that only executes, say, two op codes before exiting. And the, the VM has to do a great deal of work for very little gas. So that opens up a DOS vector. So until we have a better solution for that, I think some sort of limit is necessary. Maybe it could be increased. But, but it's it limited by the, um, by the uh, gas price anyway. So it, no, because you you pay um, you pay a fixed amount of gas for a call op code, um, but that doesn't matter. Like that's the same amount of gas regardless of how large <coughs> the contract you're calling is. But the amount of work we have to do at runtime when you call varies depending on the size of the contract. Even if you only execute the first op code, it's just going to stop. So you need to change the cost of call to depend on the size of the contract you're calling. Yep, or, or if all of the VM implementations would need to restructure to do all of their analysis at deployment time instead of call time and store it on disk. Then they have to store it forever. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so that, I, I kind of use that as a EVM implement implementer uh, because yeah, what's what's what they said is like I know when I actually build my software that the code size will not be greater than that, and I can have my, some assumptions about that because yeah, as 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 Nick said, there's some like analysis you have to do when you load the code and you're about to execute it. Uh, but I think that there are way to, to kind of work around that. I mean, some of these analyses can be done lazily, but it's much more complicated than, than what we can do now, like just scan the code once. And also this, 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 this analysis can be, can be cached. But yeah, I'm actually hugely exploiting that, doing much more things during this analysis, because I know the, the code size won't be super, super huge. When I, when I get it, so yeah, it's 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 limited by the gas price. So you can yeah, you, you cannot deploy super big contracts because like you pay for for byte to deploying that. But for me, it's it's not that really information because uh, this changes later on. So when I actually like make design decisions, doing uh, yeah, implementing EVM, this is not like strict guarantee that. I mean, I cannot guess what, what is like the reasonable uh, size. 
So that helps, yeah. But I think if like it's 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 problem for you, I mean, I guess there there might be the way to, to figure out a solution. But it's it's not easy. I mean, it's like it's, there are some trade offs, and we uh, we have to consider that. Is your software limited to 65k uh, code size? Uh, the current limit is like uh, 20, 24k, something like that. Yeah, yeah, but your software, your assumption. What, what, yeah, I'm what using do you that. Use this for? Like, I know that, for example, what was it? Uh, uh, for example, you can. Uh, you know how the, if you like, let's say you sum up of the cost of all the code, I know it will not exceed like 32 bit value because it's like the maximum code, uh, opcode cost is, is create, which is uh, 32k uh, multiplied by this code size, it's still within a 32 bit limit, right? So things like that. So I know I can, I can store like this information within a 32 bit limit. That's that's many things like this. So you have at least you, you have at least this. But I also I also can actually generate like the worst cases for this analysis and check how how much time will it take. So like this is some kind of security precaution that like yeah in the worst case when it's like the the, the worst possible uh, order of instructions that the analysis will take the longer time. It's still within some some like. We will do uh, the, the reasonable limit in terms of time spent on it. Isn't the recommendation to deal with you know the code size limit to deploy libraries and use delegate call? Yeah, but that's actually one of my questions. <laughs> so you have at least two limits in your code. You may may have two limits. One is this assumption for for the gas counter not to exceed thirty two bits, and then maybe you could also just use a sixteen bit value for, for the code offsets. Is it possible yeah. other implementations do the same? Yeah. <laughs> you, Nick, you may be familiar with the Gubitarian implementation. Yeah, I mean, they definitely, um, one of their optimizations a while ago was making some of the things such as the gas counter uh, 32 or 64 bits instead of biggins, which is the, the lead implementation. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you can certainly, uh, I mean, that comes down more to total gas limit than it does to, to code size. Um, but there are definitely uh, there are definitely uh, optimizations of that sort. But I think mostly they could support a much larger code size before they, these options start being invalid. Um, I think the yeah you know there's nothing magic about 24k, but I think we need that order of magnitude, and I think we need to be quite cautious if we talk about expanding it. Um, I mean I feel also like large contracts that are too large to fit into 24k are kind of a code smell. There's not. It, I'm not saying no use for contract is larger than that because it's definitely not true, but it's often the case that it represents trying to make a contract do too much or that you should be modularizing it more um, and then doing less. So it's a valid complaint or is it? Uh, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, there are definitely contracts that run into this for, for legitimate reasons, but I think that your first reaction when you run into it should be to do a good, to do a review of your code and say, oh, am I trying to cram way too much stuff into the EVM or on chain? And is the stuff I can take off chain? Is the stuff I can log instead of computing and storing and other things like that? Or can I modularize it better? So in the case of the DNS set contracts, for instance, there's a bunch of DNS algorithms, and each of those is a set contract that pulls out to, which makes it more flexible and also ensures that you know you're not trying to cram it all into a single contract. I agree. Sorry, one stupid follow-up. Is the uh, limit imposed on the init byte code uh, when I upload the stuff, or is it impo uh, imposed on the code deposit actually? The, the deployed byte code is what it's imposed on the, the latter, uh, which also means that you uh, the gas limit isn't as much of a limit as you think as, as you might think, because it doesn't all have to come from call data. You can generate. You could write a contract that generates a shitload of data. And no, but I'm talking about the block gas limit is the limiting factor for the code deposit anyway. Yes. So currently, when the uh, when the limit was imposed, the block gas limit was like 4 million, and that was the mark, and now it's at 8 million or 10 million, and uh, so it would just be double the, the, the size. But the, the amount of gas reward uh, for calling a contract hasn't changed, so 
we'd still be trying to do more work for the same amount of gas if we increase the gas limit. Uh, sorry, increase the code size limit. So thank you. Does modularizing it make it more expensive to run? Uh, does EVM do inlining on the back end? Uh, what are the cost considerations? Of so it can make it, it, it will often make it more expensive to run, but it depends on how you do the modularization and, and what you do. Like in some cases, maybe your model of the contract will be split into several different ones with entry points for the user, and then it actually can make it cheaper because there's smaller dispatch tables and so forth. Are there tools that help with this kind of factoring as a not that I'm aware of, but I'm not. But actually, the dispatch table was optimized, and it's, it's a binary search. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's just a, it's just a login instead of a, a linear improvement. But I mean, there are definitely advantages to having smaller contracts to call. Yeah. So I also have like my own theory about the idea that we were like supposed to have actually a bunch of contracts chain that we can reuse repeatedly, kind of like a DLL or a shared library. Of can I go into that question? That was one of my questions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, initially, so if you look at the, the, the way it was split up, there was call code to, to a library, which turned out to be a better code. Yeah. yeah. So, so I still like that idea if I think about like how I use contracts and stuff. And I think what I've been battling with is actually the fact that the, there's, a, there's a static cost to making a call. And it's like same amount of gas, and it's quite high, um, and it doesn't really reflect what you do when you're actually running. And um, so, what I would like to see is something more like what your operating system does, which is it does the computation of loading your, I don't know, your your regex library from disk. And once it's in memory, it can just recall it, and you get that advantage. So, like a more of a in the transaction, the first call is priced to something, and then maybe to some of the escape as you repeat it. Well, this is the, the call op code equivalent of net gas metering for, for the store op codes, and I think it, it makes sense for the same reasons. The other option is that we could introduce a system to uh, allow, to, to, so that people could propose well used contracts as sort of uh, effectively yeah. built ins. Yeah, yeah. You can say, I mean, my own personal pet, pet one, uh, the ENS registry yeah, yeah, is, yeah. A, is now a built in, and it costs yeah, yeah. 50 gas to call instead of 700 because we expect it to be called a lot and held in memory. <laughs> And my pet one is of course safe math. <laughs> yeah, no, that's <laughs> which, a good example. Which is like everybody uses it. So. Yeah, and if um, it was cheap enough, you could yeah. make it a pre uh, yeah. pre compile instead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think. Yeah. Right. Are you suggesting to move this into like special contracts, or are you suggesting some kind of uh, advanced caching algorithm built? I'm the I the way I'm proposing the would in an EIP we propose that. This contract at this address is now considered a special contract and has special gas metering rules. Okay. Um, and individual implementations can choose to re implement that or more advisable that they can simply load it into memory and oh, right. get it in time. It's kind of the EWASM approach of pre compiles are all now just EWASM code except for the EDM. Yeah, I mean, it could start yeah, off yeah. just like, like doing the gas price. Yeah. The clients can see how it is. So we can take a very like safe approach. But to tie it into the, the size is that's actually the problem. People don't want to pay that 700 cash repeatedly yeah. in a bulk fashion. Mm -hmm. And if we have that cost that just decreases as, as it gets called, they will only pay the 700 and then maybe it gets like stepped up and it will solve that problem. And today the main place we see delicate call used is for the deployment properties to say deployment gas. Yeah. Because it's effective there, but it's just not effective for outlined libraries. Yeah, which is what we actually want to like, yes. That's what it was designed yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. So Martin, <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to Sorry introduce yourself like, very quickly? Yeah, uh, I'm Martin, Martin Svende. <laughs> I work with the GET client and security at the um, Ethereum Foundation, but for the Ethereum infrastructure and the EVM. And I was at another panel, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> being like. So we were just discussing uh, pricing and um, pricing in general. And what we ended up with, I think, uh, Nick proposing that uh, some regularly used contracts and libraries uh, would benefit from the lower call cost. Right. So how would you... So I have a problem with... There is a general thinking sometimes that caching 
clients have caches, so we should make the things that are in the caches cheaper. And my problem with that is that caches allow a level of freedom to have whatever cache eviction policy we want. It can be least frequently used, the last recently used caches. And if you have a big machine, you will have a large cache. And if you're running it on a Raspberry Pi, you have a very small cache. And it will be slower. But if we, like, say, well, the cache should be this, and this should be cheaper, then we all of a sudden uh, encode the cache eviction policy into a consensus engine, and we encode the cache size into the consensus engine. And we need to be, make sure that if something is put into this cache, and it's then reverted, we may need to clean it up from this cache again so it's not sitting around. We need to have a journal covering this cache. And basically it's no longer a cache, but we've added a new consensus structure uh, with very strict rules on what needs to be in there, what needs to not be in there. Um, yeah, and it removed, so the, the whole cache has become just another consensus structure which doesn't help the clients but make it more complicated. So the question is, if we want to make it cheaper, I don't think we should have like anything executed in the last 10,000. It needs to be very clear about what should be cheaper and why and what kind of data structure do we need to maintain to... Uh, I, I agree and I am, I'm actually against caches in general on, on the EVM theory very easily attacked by, by an attacker who knows the eviction or the likely eviction policy. Um, we saw this in, in Shanghai and we've seen it elsewhere. Um, all they need to do is make sure that every item they fetch is out of the cache. So they, they work when you don't really need them and they fail when you need them most. And you always have to assume the worst case that everything is out of the cache and therefore you can't actually optimise your stuff further. The best you can do is when times are good your sync is slightly faster when you're catching up or maybe a lot faster. Um, what I was proposing is, is one of two things. One is effectively an extension of net gas metering to apply to uh, core operations. So if you call the same thing repeatedly in a single transaction, it costs less than you know, the second and subsequent times. The other option is a way for EIPs to say the contract with bytecode SFX at address Y is considered a public good and is used regularly because it's, say, the safe math code or something and executing the call op code to this will only cost 20 gas because we expect every client to load it into memory and start up. And that would be a very limited set of small contracts that were perceived as basically pseudo-free compliance. Yeah, so on the first idea, I think um, it, it would make sense, but probably be of maybe limited usability. And on the second idea, I think that would be, yeah, really, that would probably be really cool I, I think and useful. One might be more useful than you think because it would enable a library that has a series of utility functions that you call repeatedly from within your contract, whereas currently each call is going to cost you 700 gas. So you can defer a lot of your implementation out to the library in that case. So the, the first one kind of sounds like net gas metering for, for S4. Yes. And actually there are two EIPs uh, in that direction. At least three. <laughs> not not in a cat, not for the S store, but for the calls themselves. See. There are already two out right there, and um, the first one is actually by, by Jack and me regarding calling self. This was an issue in, in Viper, um, and another one is well, actually, this one was discussed at an all code uh, call probably over a year ago, um, and there the exact same idea came up that maybe it should be a. a generic that gas metering for the calls within uh, an execution. Uh, but it hasn't progressed anywhere. And are you guys a bit, tiny bit afraid that it might fall into the same issue as the that gas metering for S4? Yes. Uh, I think Martin, Martin, Martin made a very good point earlier today about um, how the gas stipend is a broken way to achieve a little goal and that maybe we should be looking at ways to replace that so we're not so fragile if we have to clear those sort of issues every time we change gas prices. I don't know if you want to go into detail on that. I think we are just going on all directions to make issue yeah. sure that we just get that for one, one, but, one second. Yeah, but to, to tie back to that, uh, um, if you get a, a cheaper call the next time you call something that you've already called, that's like a more generic version of an EVE that Alex had 
for uh, cheaper calls to sell. And I took that e and I did an analysis. I don't know if we can get it on the, um, on the screen there. But the analysis looked at if you have a somewhat malicious, well, a, a contract which repeatedly calls itself uh, as many times as it can first. In, so, so that means it calls itself recursively to a limit where it can't do that any longer. Uh, and when it runs out of gas there, it will do it again. So it will be like a call tree down, a call tree down, a call tree down, a call tree down. What am I looking for? Uh, GitHub.com <coughs> Holleman slash go EVM lab. Uh, no, go, go, it's go dash EVM lab. Oh, or maybe just one word, I'm not sure. <laughs> go EVM lab. Remove all the slashes. Hyphens. Anyway, uh, hyphens, yeah. Um, oh. Remove the last one. This one on the analysis. Or Search for markdown files. No. <laughs> <laughs> Find files for markdown. Find files. No, 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 no. Press no. down. <laughs> Learning new things on that. So, yeah. <laughs> the contract will basically. Uh, there's one contract which calls another contract. And the first contract does. Uh, just calls, calls the second one all the time. And what the second one does is it calls itself. Uh, and in, in the case of uh, reduced costs to something that has already been called, this would fall in the same uh, yeah, general framework. Uh, and this is how it basically looks. So first you have a recursive call tree going to a certain depth. Um, uh, this executes on 10 million uh, gas with the current. And in total, there are 56 iterations where it goes to a depth of 344, and a total of 13,000 calls can be made on 10 million gas. And if E axis E was implemented, where the reduce would be to 40 instead of 700, there would be well, obviously more than 405 iterations and the maximum depth of 503. And what we could see was that on get, without any state or anything, uh, only the pure get runtime, the execution time uh, jumped up to 1.18 seconds. I'm not sure what it was before, but uh, before it was almost 40,000 calls in total. Yeah. And then it became 171,000 calls in total. So, that's a pretty steep difference. And yeah. But I mean, you could adjust the gas price. Right, right. But so. so we have to decide what so, is the. Yeah, so the num number 40 is definitely way low. So I figured it would be using the 64 overall. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> That's what stops the recursion from reaching 1,024. But when that recursion then unfolds, all those 164s are returned. And we can go one level down and do the recursion again. It will be a shorter recursion tree because we have less to start with. Okay, so there's no way to use an explicit call that limit to prevent this flow up here? Just, just have one. No. <laughs> <laughs> but just to be clear, the proposed 14 or whatever was the, the gas was, it was just starting number, which we <laughs> should benchmark, which you right. did, so yeah. we just need to adjust the number. But this is always good to have, right? So, yeah. so if, you, if you have this, this repricing with dynamic repricing for calls that you make more often, you're going to have more calls. You can make more calls. Yes, of course. Uh, yes, it's not. Then there is an inherent. I mean, even if we call, call something that's already been called, there is an inherent overhead 
in the yeah. execution. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Cool. So, so the question is like how bad is this or like mm -hmm. Well, the question is fundamental. What figure would represent the actual cost of computational Right. Because it definitely doesn't cost as much to the end of the same function as the same contract at the time. Right, but it's, it's probably, I mean, 700 is pretty cheap if you compare it to an ex cash, which is. But it's super expensive compared to, to a jump. So then it, you get into the incentive to actually write modular contracts instead of having like a huge contract where all the internal calls are just jumps, right? So because we were discussing before that, that you, um, the repricing of call would affect that, so you should write more modular contracts, which are easier to understand, like it's probably safer in general. But if you're very extreme on saving gas, you would just like write a huge contract and just do internal calls with functions. And then you would just jump between them. But then, so there's incentive to write modular contracts against single contract um, but, but the, that's in, inherent, I mean, jump is inherently cheaper for the EVM to execute. Because right, it right, offloads right. all the, you know, you take care of all the storage of variables and stuff. Whereas right. the default is like, yeah, the EVM takes care of all of that. Yeah, yeah, of course, but I'm just, like, from the perspective of, of the incentive mm -hmm. for coders to write modular contracts, uh, that's the perspective. Yeah. Can we backtrack a tiny bit? Um, you weren't here at the beginning, and uh, I know that some people even have questions of the previous part. Oh, yeah. um, and we haven't covered that. But we started off with one single question, and we started <laughs> like this quite a bit. The single question was, uh, why is the code size limited to 24K, and could we extend that? And it has a lot of different uh, topics we can discuss, and we did quite a few of them. Uh, one, we suggested that it makes sense to break up contracts to make them more modular. But that has the issue of, of the, the cost of call and, and you know, all these overheads. Um, and we also explained that the code size limit is there because of an issue of uh, analysis cost, and it's, it's a DOS vector. And I know there was a question probably there, um, which we never answered. Can we move the, the analysis earlier uh, at deploy time? Um, do we want to cover that briefly? Uh, I think it's certainly possible to do the analysis at deploy time, and in that case, the deployer is already paying gas proportional to the size of the contract, so in some sense they're paying for it, or at least there's no discrepancy in big O's there. Um, but I think it would be a matter of, it would be a significant change to all the contract, uh, to all the EVM implementations to be able to serialize that analysis and then efficiently load it up again uh, at execution time, but it doesn't seem like an intractable possibility. If, even if we do that, uh, we would incentivize people to create bigger contracts. <coughs> we would raise the limit. I mean, to, I don't know that you'd be incentivizing it, but you'd certainly be making it practical or possible. Um, and there's still definitely some OEN overhead of loading a contract, but it's a lot lower when you don't have to step over all the bytecode and build, you know, jump, jump tables and so forth. <coughs> but let's assume we would. Uh, we would make this easier and we would raise the code size limit, but we wouldn't do anything on the call costs. Then, then we would be just expanding the space <coughs> to, to make more monolithic contracts. And the, the alternative to that is maybe consider uh, making modular contracts more attractive. And that's what we have been discussing right now. So, for instance, uh, make the cost of the pull-up code depending on the size of the contract you're calling. But, okay, yeah. yeah. It's kind of similar. I mean, I think that if I can be kind of similar to um, yeah, reducing the price every time you recall it. Would it, would it be possible to have in my contract the ability to indicate that a call could be in line? Uh, so I can still write it modularly, but I'm not paying the price of a full call because at low time, there's some hint there saying, you know, this is going to be called yeah, like Eventually, I'm going to load this external contract. <laughs> exactly. Like, I, I want to write it modularly, but I don't want to pay this cost, so inline this call. It, it seems more like a compiler optimization than the EVM one time. The, the difference would be that, um, so when I deploy my contract, okay, I'm not inline. The, the code is not inline in the contract. It's an indication to the EVM at load time to do it. So I don't pay the cost of this loaded contract. But then the address has to be static, right? Yes. But, you're also, but then you're making the EVM pay the costs, so why wouldn't you be deducted? 
I'm, I'm paying some overhead cost to indicate inline, but I'm not paying that cost every time I'm making the call. It's like a, it, it's a one time. I think, I think that looks at equivalent to doing a gas meter, okay. and that's probably this, this small change. Um, if I can back up just for one second, I'm curious. You you quote you showed times there about 1.2 seconds for a block full of these recursive calls. What is that? What's our target? Like, what's the worst possible case at the moment? For a, a you know a, a bad contract, how long going to take to execute? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so one point one is really good, right? But I mean, all, all of that is is very dependent on the hardware you're running on. Sure. And in this case, I just ran it off my laptop, and I expect to be able to run through 10 million gas in two or 300 milliseconds. Right. So in that context, uh, yeah, I should have explained that, of course. But in that context, one point, or, well, above one second is not good. But is that the worst case? Because if there are worse ones, then... You mean worst case in that particular... Oh, so no, on that particular hard, hardware, can you write a contract that takes longer than that? Well, yeah, no, that with is. any opcode? Yes, any So that's a very difficult question to answer okay. because it naturally depends on the state size. I mean, you can't say no, you can't, but I th I'm not asking if you're aware that there is one. <laughs> Am I going to tell that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. What, what I'm saying is, if, if there are worse ones, then we Tough. shouldn't really be thinking about this one because they could just right. do the other thing, which would be worse for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, so if we have other worst cases, it's okay to put something just as long as it's not as bad as the worst case? Then more, more or less. I think like, so if you, if you have something that you can't already do nowadays that is actually worse, then this one is okay. <laughs> <laughs> Setting that bar quite low, is that insane? <laughs> like if you can already do more damage. Then why is this one problem? We, at the very, at the very least, I'm not saying agree with this. Yeah. At the very least, we would be introducing a new DOS vector if that's the case. If we already have ones, we should be getting rid of those. But, yeah, exactly. but we wouldn't be making things worse. Yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> but it would, once we get rid of those, then suddenly we fall back to that. Yeah. No one. So I'm just that. asking how far away this is from a reasonable <laughs> position. You know. Well. I mean, I think we can go in that general direction, uh, but we can't like pretend that a call is equivalent to a jump because it isn't. No, it it's isn't. A lot more but I, I don't think it's seven hundred. I don't think a call to self is worth seven hundred. So this is is this suggesting yeah. that it would be more? Because this is using plus of forty. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be you know, one fifth of that or. So maybe like a 200? Yeah. Or maybe, yeah. Okay. That's what you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so that book, I think you have actually two different... Uh, does it have the pre stuff as well? That's I am one for the pre yeah. as well. But yeah. anyway, this is only for call to self, which was motivated by Viper. And Viper initially, uh, for every <coughs> single function defined in Viper, it would do an external call, so that to make those functions fully pure. Um, and this has changed, I believe, last year, and the last year of this year. And now Viper is also using jumps uh, for internal calls because obviously it's not cheap. Well, we want people to use the language. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the motivation of this proposal was to, to reduce the call to self so that Viper could, could keep using this safer method uh, of pure functions. And also Solidity could start using that. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a big fan of that because it requires you to serialize all your call arguments every time and then deserialize them. So even if call self calls were cheaper, you'd probably be spending a lot of time on on passing and, and generating bytes, especially in stateless contracts. I mean, you, you would have to navigate the whole 63, 64th rules, which would cause issues. Um, so every time you make a call, you can only send along maximum of 63 64 of the gas that you have uh, which makes it practically impossible to reach a call recursion uh, call depth of higher than i don't know a couple of hundred something yeah, like that you have that figure there so 344 uh, yes yeah uh, and that so a contract which is 
in the, in the contract world where everything is based on calls instead of jumps, that can be problematic. Uh, on the note of serialization, um, so we, we do have like the ABI encoding uh, across different contracts. But if you're calling yourself, you may not not need to use it. You can use your own format, so, which so may match the map. But you do still need to flatten things a bit. Like if you've got a data structure that has pointers to other things out there, you can't just send all of your memory to so the you know, tap to it. Yeah. Um, may I ask a question about execution environments in Ethereum 2? Would that be on topic? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have another discussion on Friday okay. where it would be a really good question. Cool, thank you. <laughs> um, so we have a ton of questions on, on Slido now. Um, do we still want to explore this uh, net gas metering for calls a tiny bit more, or should we uh, jump into some questions? I just have a question regarding it. Um, which relates to what Martin was saying about the 64. I mean, since this is a fairly special case, um, did anybody consider making it a, a new opcode? A like cold self opcode. Sorry? Like a cold self opcode? Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking that. But that's not how the 64 is through. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I guess it's not. I feel like given the the code space we have to work with, that might be... Because it can go deeper use. in the call stack there? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, what's becoming apparent is that 16 opcodes for call types was not enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, that's one thing we Just focus on, the, on your call. Call to self, and if we start introducing an opcode for that, then we really made it a very specific case, but Earlier on, we also said that this could be more generalized outside of call to self uh, to, to discount calls to contracts which were already called uh, in the given um, <coughs> execution. And that's, that's the one which would be useful if we want to have more modular contracts to have libraries. Um, but that wouldn't be called to self. That wouldn't no. be called to self. <laughs> but I think, yes, I think this analysis probably pertains to it as well. Right. So, do, do you guys see any, any issues considering uh, this more generic case? I guess the question is that you need to do a bit of analysis on how much can you force the EVM implementation to load into memory. Like, if you take the square root of the number of calls you can make and you call that many contracts that many times, you know, how much memory would that involve? How many calls would that involve? You know, would that be reach the problem point of being a problem? Because the EVM implementation has to be able to hold all those memory for the whole transaction because you can't rely on caching because the aforementioned mentioned attack that will just overrun your cache. But intuitively to me it seems like if that's the price, then it would be effectively the same as the same. So an interesting case there is you have, you have your contract, you use a bunch of libraries, you keep calling them, you cache the ton of them, and now you call out to a brand new contract. And, uh, and then you want to also cache stuff, which is happening there. Um, are you, I mean, you cannot just invalidate the old stuff anymore. No, your, your um, cache needs to be relative to the current address. So you, you maintain potentially multiple caches. Should that be the case, or shouldn't you be able to reuse the previous one as well? Because they've already loaded. Yeah, you're wrong. I was wrong. No, it's just, um, I mean, I really like the idea, but I'm really worried that it's going to fall into the same problems as the NetGas gas, net gas maintainer. No, no, I mean, are you talking specifically about the reentrancy issue? The I mean, NetGas maintainer has the reentrancy issue, but apart from the reentrancy, it was just quite complex, and there were so many versions of NetGas gas maintainer. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it takes forever to... And, and even in the, the, the last hard fork, uh, well, coming up to this symbol with, with the net gas metering, uh, it seems to be hard to, to get people to write down a clear specification and clear test cases for them. And I mean, I, I wrote the very first version of net gas metering, and in retrospect, I wish I'd been less focused on trying to get the net gas to exactly reflect what the actual costs are, and more on just some loading the fruit. You know, the, uh, a simpler implementation that captures some of the efficiencies rather than a a more complex one that tries to reflect all of it. Um, 
So maybe that's the, the approach that needs to be taken. I'm not actually up to date on the latest variant of the proposal. <coughs> I think the latest one has some extra, uh, an extra rule just to get around the, the slight issue. Yes. Um, so I, I would have a question to Martin and uh, Nick, I guess. Um, so I think there was like an article or a paper some time ago just showing that like, I remember the percentage was like it was a really high percentage of contracts that are actually the same as the deployed ones. And I guess most of these are probably safe math and similar contracts. Like what would, so this whole thing that we're talking about, the repricing of call, would be um, to aid developers, right? Not really to make it easier for the clients and more work for the client. Um, what, what would be the difference for the client? Um, so, guess, okay, one case right now have all these contracts being the same. Of course, I don't assume that the client stores all of them separately. Um, but then, if you have if people start writing more modular contracts and just delegating calls, then you're going to have a fear of them deployed. So, what would look different in the client in that case, or would? Would it be basically the same? So it's already um, already hashed by code right. storage and that key value store yeah. or a content address store. So it might be multiple contracts over the codes when you store once. So yeah. I don't think it would have a big impact there. Um, incidentally, the, I, I had reason to look this up just the other day. The most popular contract on Ethereum, one of the most avoid copies, is guest open two. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, followed by a couple of um, uh, proxy contracts. <coughs> for exchanges who use contract wallets oh, to receive wow. deposits, uh, followed I think by um, I think it's one other and then there's EMC's deed contract. Um, and of course we shouldn't be ragging on these ones in particular to so, um, <laughs> because they're of course actually they're paying a lot more gas than they're actually the costs they're actually occurring. You know, they pay every time the contract stored as if it was a brand new one, but yep. they're, they're not using any more storage. Yeah. Uh, the, so the clients currently store the contracts only once, but that's not something which we should enshrine or assume because there are, there are, it might change over time. Majority? No, I was thinking primarily uh, because if they are stored, if they're undeduplicated, right now they're deduplicated, and if they're undeduplicated, that makes it possible to have another representation which is more amenable to things like um, leaf syncing or s accessing everything pertaining to a specific account in one disk I.O. Or there can be things that are better representing it that way. I mean, presently it is enshrined because the sync protocol requires that you Feature, feature contract the current fast protocol, yes. But um, that's not the ultimate fast protocol. Yeah, true. Um, just, just as a data point, um, like my math currently storing all the contracts in a client, minor without the count for overhead accounts for about a gigabyte. Um, and then the rest of the contracts are in It's actually impossible to delete things from a, de a deduplicated unless we, storage. Unless we start doing reference counting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which should have been built into the protocol. But How does create two affect that? Um, I don't think it affects the, the end result. Um, I mean, it probably make your reference counting a little more complex, I guess. Since most clients are doing that now, I mean, I, I contract storage is a lot cheaper than S store storage, and I don't think it's illegitimate to want to store infrequently changed data in there. Um, but if people start doing that, then we are going to run into issues where we need to start garbage collecting old contracts, and they need to have start reference counting them and so on. So, well, I mean, uh, so in the garbage collecting old contracts, there is. Um, <coughs> With the, the repricing coming up for S though, there's this 
other discovery that it is cheaper if you have a lot of linear data. It is cheaper to That's store it as a contract and use Xcode copy. Yeah. Or, or even to call it and ask it to return some of its own bytecode. Yeah. But yeah. assume the case when it's just pure data and you Xcode copy it, yeah. Yeah. then uh, preference counting. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, you know, much like S token, this is waiting for something to exploit or use now. <laughs> uh, unlike S token, I don't think it's a net bad. I think it's just it, it reveals an area where nobody's bothered to optimize because previously it hasn't been enough of an issue to spend time on. Um, but I, I think that the costs of contract storage roughly reflects the the actual costs and incur on clients, you know, that it's cheaper because it actually you can choose less resources than a store where you've got this massive Merkle Patricia tree of nodes. But this, this also opens up the question, uh, why is the storage value, not the key, but the storage value limited at 32 bytes? Um, because if you if you could have more, you know, data there. Yeah, no, I, uh, storage should absolutely be a page table type setup with large pages, so it would cost a lot to load the first value in a given page and then very little to load the subsequent ones because that's how disk storage works. It's cheap to load, like with the trade-off point on modern machines is about 128k. That's when you're spending half your time waiting for the fetch to return and half the time receiving the data. And that would be a much more sensible size than the lights in 4k. Um, but I think retrofitting that now into the EVM would be extremely difficult. <laughs> uh, you, could, you could probably do it without changing the outcome. So you just make your store a lot more expensive for the first feature on a page and cheaper than elsewise. But we've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of contracts deployed that rely on being able to use contract storage as a massive hash table, you know, and they would all become overnight ten times more expensive. <laughs> Can you explain a tiny bit more what you mean by the page table method? How would that so work on, on the output level? Effectively, instead of treating contract storage as a big 256 bit, 32 byte to 32 byte NAT, you would treat it as a series of pages. And so when you do a fetch, you basically treat the last few bits as the, the position of the page and the first bits as which page it is. Um, and then you, uh, you know, with the first time you fetch a given page, you charge them a lot of gas for that. And the subsequent, like maybe two, three, five times what the current is load costs. But then the subsequent times when that page is already in memory, you charge only, uh, you know, comparable to inload costs to, to load it out or to store it back potentially. Um, and so the off codes could be the same. It's still just S load and S store. It's just treating the semantically. It's treating the value differently. Um, so it would still load 32 bytes at a time. It would still return you 32 bytes. It would yeah. load 128k and then just give you the 32 bytes you asked for. Yeah, and as long as you you go within the same page. Yeah. You would only be charged much for the first yeah. But that would radically change how languages needed to store data. Instead of using uh, the entire storage like a hash table, they would need to start using you know things like red black trees and so on in order to store stuff in contiguous ranges. A, a similar idea was was uh, explored to some I guess limited extent by Alexia Tubogev, at least on an idea level, and we discussed it. <clears throat> similar, but definitely not the same. Uh, instead of using S load to, to have pages, it would be memory mapping uh, the entire storage. Yeah. I, I think that would have similar effect, and maybe I don't know whether it would be better or worse. I'd be able to think about it more, but it's a sensible approach, I think. Yeah. Um, but there's one trade off here it pushes, <clears throat> it pushes the, all the code to do hash tables to the language. Um, well, so it definitely shouldn't be hash tables because hash tables have amortized over one and every time you need to expand the hash table you have to do OE work, um, which means that you know every 10,000 or every you know, if you do a thousand transactions and then the next one needs to use more gas than the lock limit and your contract falls over. So if you're going to do this, you have to use something that is fixed O log in time, like a red black tree. Uh, and it does mean you need to do that in a language or in a precompile. You know, you could do our, our cheap precompiles type thing to do this. Um, but this is far from unique. The, the C standard library has its own that implements hash tables, so does the Java standard library, so does everyone else. So yeah. I don't think it's unreasonable to use it to do that. <clears throat> I mean, coming from, from a developer experience point of view, a lot of contracts really rely on a mapping. Yes. That's like the core data structure they use. They, they can still have that. It's just that the language would have to do more work behind the scenes <coughs> to implement that. 
Yeah, I don't think it's an issue that the language would, would have to do that. I think okay, it would be just an initial investment that yeah. all of these languages would have to write something. Um, and then perhaps people would, would complain that it's slow and they, somebody would optimize it. You know, somebody magically optimize it. But, uh, <laughs> but even then, uh, as you mentioned, either it would be in the bytecode, in every single deployed bytecode, or you would have to generalize it out into some kind of library yeah. uh, or recompile. And we end up with the same, same issues as we discussed before. So it seems to be all of these, you want to change a tiny thing and you, you have suddenly a bunch of other parameters that you, you have to think about. Yeah, that's, that's the way of gas pricing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. well, while we're at it, I'll just say that I have memory should also have been a page table. There's exactly. no reason a bunch of <laughs> should have to start at the beginning and pay to expand it linearly. Uh, we could write much more natural compilers if we could have a heap at one end and a stack at the other and so on. Yeah, so this was, I think, um, but, yeah, I wish Pavel was here now because Pavel was discussing it with Daniel, with Daniel. Um, a few weeks ago. So Daniel was like, why, why is it not pages? And then, just wondering like, if this was discussed before, and then I don't remember exactly the. the Maybe Leo, to give some background to, to you guys, um, this this was a discussion on the Solidity Dev channel, which is open to anyone to join. Uh, it's mostly about the compiler, but it has some of these kind of interesting questions, and it originated from memory management, how memory is managed the, the compiler. Uh, I mean, in the contracts, but it's it's written by the compiler. And you can only expand the memory, you, you cannot do anything else. Uh, and in, in, in any given function, you may want to just use temporary memory. Uh, and the, the issue was that we wanted to maybe reduce memory usage because memory is expensive. And the, you want to throw away the temporary memory. But it's kind of a challenge if you want to do this in, in a generic way because you may use, so you have your starting memory or the use at, to a certain extent, you get into a call, you, you want to use some temporary memory, but at some point you may also want to store data which wouldn't be temporary. And it becomes a challenge, but if you have page tables, then, then you, you can do that easily. It occurs to me for some reason, I knew this very moment, that we could actually change that without big impacts on existing contracts. Because if we're using page tables and we have the same gas cost for the total amount of memory you're using, rather than the first n bytes, then existing contracts will continue to operate the way they are, but new contracts could take advantage of the fact that something they could write to weigh the heck off somewhere. The proposal Daniel came up with during the discussion. So we're talking about memory page tables, probably, yeah. which you had an opinion on. Um, the proposal was to maybe use some high bits of the, the, the offset to indicate the page table. Yeah. So what's your opinion on that, Paul? About the high bits? Well, just to have page tables in memory. <laughs> Uh, you have a concern on, on the pricing. Mm, where are I? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Should I open up the chat? <laughs> so actually I don't remember that. But uh, anyway, yeah, I think in general I think like there will be like very a lot of nice features to have, but I'm not sure it's practical actually to introduce them. So like uh, unless we, we, we find a way to, to do it in some in the way that it will not affect existing contracts. Um, I, I think I have a way to do that. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. And I'll um, write an ink, and then you can tell me why. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on the high bits, yeah, I'm kind of, I don't like using high bits within the uh, 256 values, because means I now have, uh, when you, when you actually implement stuff, you actually can just trim it to like 32 bits on, like in terms of memory access, and then I have to actually consider the upper upper things as upper like part of the of the of the value. But maybe it's not so big deal. What I usually do when there's like proposal, I try to make a prototype implementation, and then I can actually comment how would uh, it affect my implementation at the end. So. <coughs> Maybe there's a way to kind of work around that, uh, but I would like my first choice would be to use uh, even if we have some like bit masking and like uh, differentiate like addresses or anything else uh, from each other within the same type or, or something to use some high bits by within the 64-bit uh, range. 
Apologies, I have to go around to this other panel. It's less interesting than this one, so don't follow me. <laughs> <laughs> So what, what, what do you think about this story? Uh, I have not considered it before and I don't think I have anything really to add. I need to read up on the EAP if um, Nick writes one. <laughs> Maybe I can speak that. Do we want to cover some of the questions from the slide because there are a lot of questions there? Yeah, we're still talking about the 32 bit of white memory. Uh, all these issues are interrelated, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, contract size, size limit. That's what's wrong with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, we should maybe go I think the number wasn't related to that anymore. Okay, that was the yeah, first one that was. Yeah, it just came and yeah, then from the story. Yeah, it from the story. So, one of the questions we have here is um, which still relates to the, the earlier discussion. Uh, on stateless contracts. Uh, why are zero bytes in the transaction data cheaper than non-zero bytes? They're not. That's a list of all. So what are they priced now? They're priced equally alike, aren't they? No, maybe they went down to 16 from 68. But only for a transaction data. Yeah, what other types of data are we talking about? Yeah. That's the only way yeah. they differ. But they yeah, were but not general memory, just transaction. Yeah. So, so okay, so some context around this. When you send a transaction, it has historically been the case that the data that goes into a transaction, I think that if it's a byte is zero, it costs four. Yeah. And if it's non-zero, it costs 68 gas. Now, for calls that happen within, um, within yeah, with it from a contract to another contract, there is no such distinction. Uh, what you pay for uh, is memory expansion, uh, if, if any memory expansion happens. Um, so, I mean, you can send a long megabyte of data, but not actually cost anything in the gas if you have already expanded the memory to that megabyte. Um, and yeah, so with Istanbul, we're lowering the, this cost of 68, which concerns only the outermost transaction, lowering it to 16. Um, and the initial reasoning to have different differentiation between zero and non zero is that zeros are more compressible, as far as I understand. That was the reasoning. Yeah, and it was assumed there would be a compression um, algorithm. Yeah. Adapted of some sort, but it wasn't really adapted until uh, Snappy and right. It was introduced on the E flair with the introduction of Snappy around maybe one and a half years ago or something. Yeah, I don't don't get why zero would be more compressible than any other number, uh, but lots of the same numbers would be possible. Well, I guess yeah. the assumption was that you yeah, have more right. zeros. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think the assumption is that zeros happen more. Well, otherwise, there would have to be a more intricate scheme to figure out the problem. Also, when you have uh, padded data, it's a bunch of zeros. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Probably, and you probably have that a lot. Probably if it was more ABI encoding. Yeah, but I think ABI encoding wasn't existing quite for that. Right. <laughs> Actually, that decision was made. Really? <laughs> Yeah, because it predates the, the solidity effect. Oh, really? Which the transaction zero bytes? Yeah. Hmm. All right, we have, we have another question. Uh, still relating to output pricing, and we kind of explored it, and I think somebody wanted to ask that question. But should <clears throat> should output pricing be updated every hard fork uh, using some benchmarks? So should we always reprice things to, to what they, they are at that point? It'd be interesting to have like a set of benchmarks that you always run and kind of reevaluate. Really also, like always adding things to it as well. Would that mean we would need a fixed set of benchmarks first, <laughs> which calculate yes. everything? So I think still like we have to split like state access opcodes and computational opcodes. I think that they should be uh, addressed differently. I actually have some like. In mind some idea how to make 
maybe try to uh, evaluate all computational outputs in more like systematic way to actually have some kind of benchmarks to run on it. And that could be, uh, well, it, it, this would have something like a script to reproduce that and check it. Yeah, and I mean that's what, the, that's what the hard part, right? It, the hard part is is designing yeah. that benchmark analysis, it's like the one Martin did for, um, you know, yeah, to, come up to determine that S load was way underpriced. And then the one that these uh, guys did, and they, the paper that came out, the seventy-two second yeah. block. So okay. So you know, once yeah. we have those, then yeah, we can start repeating and systematically running these benchmarks. But we haven't really had yeah. these. Um, you know, analyses until quite recently. Yeah, so my, my ideal situation would be like we have as like some kind of let's say algorithm or program that actually we can run and then it outputs numbers and then we can discuss about the the algorithm and the program, not like the numbers themselves. So like maybe that we need to change the algorithm and something like that. We mostly talk about the script that, that produce the numbers, not like the numbers and so on. Um, that would be, I think, ideal in that respect. I mean, the best we can have within within the, the EVM. Uh, but if it's done, if, if whenever it's doable, I think, uh, well, I think nobody is working on that uh, at this point. So. Yeah, I think that technically it would be ideal to do repricings as often as we can, but then there's this like <coughs> social aspect that we actually do screw up for people when we do it. So it needs to be done with a bit of... Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I didn't mean actually like we should actually use that to reprice yeah. every hard fork, but at least like check what... Like, yeah, the, yeah, I mean the question from, yeah. the, from the slide. I yeah, hear. I'm also on this opinion like... And unless we need it, I think it's not worth to do that. Uh, and for computational opcodes, we have like big margin as set before of safety at this point. So, so on, on, on one side, coming up to Istanbul, probably mostly triggered by your EIP repricing S load. Um, <coughs> a lot of people were concerned that it's gonna it's gonna break the contracts or it's gonna be way more expensive for them. So there seems to be a really big, big clash between those people who write the clients and, and try to ensure that prices are somewhat reflective to what is happening compared to the people who use these outcodes. How can any of this result or get any closer? Any, anyone has any? Should people just accept? Versioning, right? Yeah, but I don't think some version wouldn't have sold anything in the 894 case where... I mean, you can't really opt in to like, yeah, I want to use the more expensive opcodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, at least you protect the, the over contracts yeah. this way. And then, and then yeah, if you want to deploy it after the new rules, then you have to adjust. And then you can like be responsible oh, for it. But then you're responsible for whatever you're deploying. Yeah. But then, like, if you change something that affects what's already well, deployed, like it, it does no, get complicated too. When the right new now. version is calling a contract that you know was deployed with the old version, so it's not an easy answer to just say yeah, the version anyway. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, and it's difficult on that. Like, if you have a, if you deploy an old style deployer contract, which can deploy any contract you throw at it, and then in the new world throws code at it, will it be deployed with the Old rules of the right. That's a good. Nothing. That's a good point. Yeah. If the band knows somehow. <laughs> so if, if it would be opt-in, why would anybody opt-in for a higher gas price? They opt in for the lower gas price. You know, for like all the uh, um, really cheap uh, computation. I mean, you assume that say a new version, which you can opt-in, would have things which are cheaper and things which are more expensive. Mm -hmm. And they would opt in because some, some are cheaper. Right? right, but the things that are cheaper can accomplish the same thing as the things that are more expensive in the old version. Like, you know, instead of reading data from S load, you can read it from the call data. But I think they meant that, you know, if, if it's not opt in, but it, it's mandatory, but it only applies for new contracts. Yeah. yeah. So there were a couple of different versions of these uh, version proposals. 
and one of them would say that <coughs> you could select the version you're deploying. Another one was saying that uh, you could only deploy the new version, <laughs> you cannot deploy the old one. The other complications were when you, within the contract, an already deployed contract, if you want to create another contract, can you define the version there? Or should you take the version of the contract you are in? And we can appropriate it. <clears throat> yeah, and then what happens when you call contracts <coughs> of different versions? What kind of rules apply there? Yeah. yeah, well, I think that was figured out. I mean, we selected one of these versions. We just like decided not to actually uh, enable that. But I think th there is one. I don't think it was fully resolved. What was probably resolved is that the current set of contracts deployed are version 1, and then you have version 2. And if you yeah. deploy something, that's only going to be version 2. Yeah. And if you create something, it's going to be the version you are in. Yes. But the question how you deal with calling an older version that wasn't it was because we had implementation of that, that when you call like like all version, you just execute the old version and all all its content. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Version. I think that's the yeah. only thing that Because it was it was close to be and it's your I mean, fault. So yeah, it was implemented. I mean I, I'm not a big fan of versioning in general, know, but yeah. I mean what scares me about versioning is if they could we we might say we have like the the version. There's no like more like version at this point. I mean, this one like kind of winning now. That's what, what I wanted to say. Yeah, what scares me is if there you know would be a new version at every hard fork, and then all of a sudden we have five versions that can run concurrently. That's just way too complex. So it's rather be like <laughs> that's one, why I don't like one new version, and that's one where we continually update. You know, opcode gas costs. So if anybody assumes that it's constant, well, if you're on that new version, it'll break. You know, get rid of the 2300 gas subsidy, and all that kind of stuff. Do that all in new version, and then we only have two versions. So you're saying, you're saying that uh, whatever is there today would be locked in in the state, and then from no, no on, everybody agrees that gas prices is going to change mm -hmm. over time. So that would be, yeah, so there's another also. Mm -hmm. But then you could end up, yeah, basically writing a contract that has a current new rules. And then they got some big improvement of rules. Because you opted in in advance to the new new rules. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's I mean that's a good tool. Ideal would be I don't know, people can write things so that opcode, you know, gas cost changes are gonna break them. <laughs> so there was this other aspect to it that there might be two different kinds of gas changes. There, one set of gas changes is where, where you, you want to make some features better and compensate against some other things. But the other set of changes is fixing something against the DOS vector. So something pressing the issue which you cannot just do in version 2 and leave version 1 alone because you can already exploit that in version 1. And and people said that those kind of changes you can still apply in the old version. So it's, it's kind of confusing. We have one version, version for opcode. <laughs> <laughs> for each opcode, you can say which version you're in. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> Just help me. <laughs> Do you um, anticipate it's possible that there are various opcodes whose gas prices could change by like order of magnitudes uh, in the future? Because in my opinion, in regards to this proposal where uh, a smart contract developer could opt in to a gas system where gas prices do change, I think it would be like a code smell if the code you write today is already close to you know, like hitting the block gas limit in any certain transaction. Um, and so you know, your, your transactions should be much smaller than that in general. And so if the changes are marginal, I think that would be fine for most developers. But I mean, is it possible that certain opcodes could have their gas prices changed by orders of magnitude rather up or down? Uh, I think it's unlikely. It happened, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Esther was at 50 and then raised to 200, right? It's not really an order of magnitude. Call was 40. Call was 40, raised to 700. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Esther was going to go up to 800. From 200. Yeah. yeah. But so still, that's an order of magnitude from, from the first one. 50. Yeah. 
And if you, I mean, saw Powell's DBM1 benchmarks uh, this morning, then you would see there's room for like order of magnitude um, price changes. Can I jump in here? Yeah, I just did some um, research recently. And just looking at execution times from 0 to 8 million blocks for the instructions. And you can see like all the size dependent instructions have been increasing. So I'd expect that the gas price over time will also increase linearly. Yeah, me too. Mm, but we can go down. I mean, it's like lowering the gas, the gas cost. So I don't sure it's actually safer. I mean, it looks like uh, because if you had some assumptions and like everything else gets cheaper than like the single opcode that stays, uh, it might be it might be a better way. But uh, did that ever happen before? No. With the <laughs> gas metering, it is. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We've, yeah, we've been doing this. Oh. And that runs into this type of issue. Free components have been made cheaper. Yeah, you know, all, I'm mostly co like talking about like not state access thing. Yeah. Yes, that's my like if you want to lower the computation of goods. Uh, so like there's two options, like rise everything up because we don't have like actually lots of space here. Uh, because like they are like two, three, and something. This is the, the values. Um, so like if you could, like price everything by ten, but then like I think there will be a lot of issues to, to the existing contract to handle that because all of this like gas passing to different uh, calls and so on. So actually, we can like lower them to like uh, uh, to something that is. Uh, Fractional value, right? And there's, I guess, there's a way to implement that. So yeah, in case there's any both fractional yeah. gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and there was a discussion there about that. Why don't you just? So the problem is that a lot of the arithmetic opcodes are priced at one or two or three or is it five? Anyway, they they priced at one, and you cannot really reduce one anymore. <laughs> well, you can try. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think, like, I would actually consider option to price everything at one and just... Leave it there. I mean, it's, it's much easier than to go with fractional. But then someone's going to write a contract that has the one that actually does take more computation, computation and then, like, I mean, you only meant the computation of goods, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you think there's no, no way that if everything's priced as one, that someone's going to find some? Like division, I mean, it's quite expensive on big units. No, not if you're sure, like, it actually costs like point uh, okay. or one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If even the worst so case, like, you make sure all the arithmetic is actually one. Uh, it's lower, yeah. it's lower. So, yeah. Okay, fair. Like, save us a lot of work to become a fractional. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. But I'm not sure, like, the, the impact of that is good enough to actually justify it. I mean, if it, like, gets substantially cheaper than that. So this may be a quick question to you guys, um, because we were like quite deep into this, and uh, not many of you are left. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions, or should we should we maybe call it a day? I have one question. Yeah. Um, it's more related about. Um, so, um, what are your thoughts about the storage layout? Because what I'm trying to do is, how can I get the storage of a contract, like inspect the storage very easily? And uh, I think right now you need to go to the initial deployment, look for all the transactions get all the traces of the contract, and then you can do any computation, or is there any war towards, to uh, you know, how to inspect easily <coughs> the start of a contract? There is actually, uh, I think it's not a working group yet, but there have been a bunch of proposals, at least on Solidity, that the compiler would output the map of the storage, and you would use that in the debugging tools. Um, there has been a proposal, nothing has been implemented yet, but this, this might happen at some point. There are often debug methods to like dump the storage of a contract uh, address, but I don't know, I can't remember if there's RPC calls for that. Yes, there is, I think. So, and it's probably only on the Geth client, I'm not sure. Uh, 
range storage range app debug right, yeah. but storage range app allows you to iterate over the storage of a contract. I don't I, I suspect that you won't get it from Infura, uh, but you on a local one. Probably not. I don't think they expose the mm. you, you can you cannot get traces from Infura. No, it's not traces. It's, it's just it's the, the, the storage method. slide. Yeah, oh, okay. it's like a debug. But you can by a uh, uh, myth rule. Which uses inferior by default. Yeah. So somehow, Linux uses it as well. <coughs> yeah, it was it was implemented in Geth for the use of Remix for Remix to use. Mm -hmm. if yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure you can buy a mithril <coughs> the address, like the main app address, and the slot that you want, and it just keeps it as slot. I think the problem was that you need to figure out the slots you want. But I mean. You want to dump all yeah, the you know that yeah, already? Yeah, I, I want to know the, the whole the layout. Uh, uh, yeah, the right, layout. Okay. But on the like solidity, well, on any contract. Uh, to on visualize it. So it has to be in, in, I need, the input is the contract address, uh, and I want to get all But you want to get the values that are there at the moment. Yes, what is in the contract. Yeah, storage range app is the RPC method. But I mean, that, that won't solve the whole problem, though, because you want to know what Indices, uh, yeah, so you have like a, a balance mapping, then you would need to know all of the solidity locations that, that the map ends up hashing to. Yeah, right. you need sure. both. You need both. You need like a static storage layout, yeah. like what you wanted. Remix has the. And the dynamic one to see what exactly it is the one to, to know what slot you're interested in, and the other one to know what's there. That one time. But then even if you have the method by which Solidity uh, deduces the key, yeah. you would also need to have access to history to know which ones have been written. Yeah. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. you don't, you can, not if you iterate the storage trace. And I think that's what storage range app does. But you can't, like, for instance, get your original key, right? If you, if, because you hash the key of a mapping. Yeah. So do you use the, there's a pre-image Dumb as well, so it saves the pre-image keys, and I'm remembering all this because <laughs> that was something that was bugging me. And I mean, now it's a feature in in Remix, and I helped implement that feature uh, with the the storage mapping. So Remix has this like state, you know, um, the deep one. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, yeah, to show the you know the like state mapper, so it maps the storage keys to the solidity. Um, Variable names. Okay. So that sounds like the <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think I understand you need actually three things, right? <laughs> 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 so you need story, storage map, what they call it, right? Mm -hmm. Storage, storage layout. layout. You yeah. need uh, account range add, no, storage range add, something. Storage range add. And yeah. also, the, it's the also pre RPC, the pre image of, of the hashes. So if you combine all of these, <laughs> after one year you might get. <laughs> but I mean, you, you can actually you can get the storage out, but you don't. Yeah, you you won't know the keys. Yeah. Well, but you could mine them. You could mine them. <laughs> you could figure out which ones you are interested in. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. But what what or, or go through the traces and see what which. I think Remix automatically does that though. I mean, it'll, yeah, it'll yeah Remix d does that, but just for one single, the current transaction. If you want to see the whole history, like yeah, aggregate the whole uh, storage layout, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you can do it. Yeah. Well, probably because there's no, um, uh, what's the get list of transactions that RPC method that never got uh, added. What did you mean with you can't know the keys or the other keys? Because when you, if you only look at the storage try and you iterate that, what you get is not the key, but the hash of the key. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other question? Mm -hmm. um, I'm using AVI Encoder V2 for my contract, and but it's still experimental, right? Um, what are the problems I have? And like, do you have any thoughts? I I guess when it will be final. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the main reason why JVM Encoder V2 hasn't been properly released yet as non-experimental is that we're still fuzzing it a lot and the fuzzer wasn't prepared fully.
to fuzz all the complicated cases for DB and Kodo V2, because there's a lot of weird scenarios. So that's the main reason, basically. And But for the next break and release, 060, it's still going to be experimental, but at least it's not going to issue the warning anymore that you shouldn't use it, because it's experimental. So, and maybe 070, it's, it stops being experimental and it's default, hopefully. There was just a talk about that fuzzing effort, too, right? Yeah. Maybe it's 1.0. 1.0. If there are no other questions, I would suggest maybe. Did we cover all the questions? From well, <laughs> we can't cover all the questions, but are you guys interested in that? Or do you guys want to have a coffee break and uh, see another talk after? <laughs> um, since Nick Johnson is in here, I feel like this is a safe place to talk about the uh, gas stipend. Uh, it's actually a good idea. Um, I'll be ready for coffee. <laughs> you mean if it's a good idea to have it? Or? I mean if it's a good idea to, um, by default, have contracts be forced to execute unknown code when they want to do a simple value transfer. Hmm. So, so like, from my perspective, I, I truly horribly hate this one because and all the calls because whenever I implement calls in EVM I do it wrong and I did it like, like ten times already and every time I do it it's because like all the checks and all the conditions have to be precise in the like, strict order and the stipend like cuts like doubles all of these. So yeah, from, from like from inside EVM I would like I would be super happy if it can remove that. But, I'll show you that. Where is this strict order <laughs> defined? Can you go to your I don't know, maybe yellow paper, but I never read it. Yellow paper so. doesn't have everything in a strict order. It doesn't specify no, like, like, updated, when yeah, stipend is added and like when you actually check the gas and like if it's uh, well, whatever. There are a lot of conditions in the call. Yeah. And I think there were cases where you could do them in a different order, and the, the test suite was coming up the, the same successful result. I think it's it's fixed by at least the, the tests the test suite because it was generated out of like one of the implementations, and like some of them actually adjusted. And I don't know, maybe that's the case. I'm not sure, but but anyway, some context around this. So there's one group of people who think that there's a problem that. I cannot send money to a contract <coughs> and prevent it from executing code. I cannot send it zero gas and some cash. And then there is another group of people who think that any time you receive Ether, it's really awesome that you can execute code and it should always be given full gas to do whatever it wants. Um, right now it's being given 2300 if transfer is used. There's kind of a middle ground where people say uh, there should be, it should be allowed to execute code, but it should not be able to do state modifications. And that's kind of where this 2300 comes from, the current gas statement, because that was sufficient to do a log operation or two, and maybe an S load, uh, but not actually do an, a state modification. And right now, this 2300 thing is a kind of ugly hack to, uh, to allow a bit of execution, but not too much execution, and <coughs> not allow state modification. So there are different ways that this discussion goes. Uh, like one, one group maybe wants to do, have a special call that only sends money and do nothing. A static transfer. Right, and then the middle group might want to have like static call with value and logs, so the receiver can do can consume infinite number of infinite gas, but he can really only do like arithmetics and log operations, uh, not not modify state. Uh, I think that's right. Before, before we dis discuss which one may may have issues or is good. What is the reason people want to have code executed when they receive them? And there are so, two yeah. reasons yeah. Uh, people want that today. 
And the first one, I think, is really they want it to they be want guaranteed to be possible, right? Yeah, to, to have the code executed. And the, one of the main reasons people want that, they want to reject incoming transfers if the contract is not supposed to store money. Because if you don't do that and it stores money and you don't have a way to retrieve it, then it's just lost. And the second thing people want to do is uh, have a log and be able to catch that, that the contract received. Yeah, right. Coming but money. it's still possible to like, nuke people with money if you use the self-destruct trick. And the coin yeah, is that's true. true. But so it's, it's <coughs> very much explicit then, right? So like, yeah, you wanted to but, do that. But still, you have the option of doing it through this yeah. method. Then, you know, it's clearly now up to the calling contract to choose whether the um, contract you're calling it you should uh, have the ability to execute code or not. And then it seems like this gas stipend uh, doesn't still serve a purpose because it doesn't enforce uh, the invariant that the contract you're calling into um, can always execute code because there is this case where it cannot. Yeah, so there's a case to work around. Yes, it's true. Yeah, so it just seems but like it was that. just overlooked. I mean, nobody said EVM is consistent. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so it's a safety feature and. Could probably analyze, you know, the chain history and see how many times that's kept people from burning their ether by sending it to a contract that attempting to send to a contract that wasn't right. supposed to receive it. I wonder, you know, how many people, how much ether it saved. But probably quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I'm arguing that this is like a silly feature. But Know, preventing people from doing stupid things yeah. is something that the compiler should do. Yeah, I agree. You can always write stupid uh, EVM code. Yeah, but like, <laughs> that's actually, I mean, that actually allows compilers to do that, I mean, to reject it. Otherwise, it couldn't prevent it in like uh, some of the cases, which are actually doable now. It's why we're doing the same. There's the payable feature. Yeah. yeah. Is it rejecting incoming transfers? Uh, yeah, yeah, the default, yeah, on default. So if you don't have a default function, but you can specify by the default. Oh, uh, it's a fallback, it's written, right? Yeah. And then by the default. Well, I said today, maybe not tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, no, I said it's going to be a fallback. <laughs> Um, I've heard in the past in regards to this, some people propose, I, I don't think this would happen at this point, but propose that Ether, uh, like the native Ether, um, be re-implemented as an ERC-20 so that we wouldn't have this like kind of one asset that's a special case. From like an EVM developer's perspective, is there any reason that Ether does have to be this special native thing, or is it theoretically possible that it could be an ERC-20 contract without a crazy amount of uh, changes to the so I only have a counter argument to that. You could also just implement the ERC20 on the EVM. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a simple thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, wrapped, wrapped ether. Um, it had, it, I don't think there's a way around it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Not, not, not for what the original vision was for the EVM. Mm -hmm. I would say there are like two very uh, endpoints, two different parts to the discussion. One is the, the ERC-20 stuff. So with um, what people do is, is wrap the ether, and you can actually write your contract in a way you only use the ERC-20 interface, reject all ether transfers, and then it's it's a UX issue that you require your users to use wrapped ether. Uh, on top of that, it also has an extra cost, and why do you want to pay that cost if ether is a built-in token? Um, so for that, there, were, there was one proposal that maybe the wrapped ether should be kind of a standard system contract or pre compiled if you want. Um, <clears throat> and it would be practically free to deal with that. And users wouldn't need to manually transfer the ethers into this wrapped ether contract. You could just, through this extra contract, you could uh, handle your ether as if it were ERC20. But it wouldn't affect everything else. Uh, and I think that might be a good like workaround. Um, but the other end is, the beginning of your question, why is Ether this, this native thing? Cannot you just make it more flexible and use other things? Uh, there was a proposal 
a long while ago for account abstraction to, it was just the first step uh, in the process to getting rid of Ether as like this native thing, uh, where in theory you could use other things to pay for execution. Uh, but that is a really long process and it stopped at the first step and we never got any past it. So, uh, to be honest, I don't think it will happen. Mm -hmm. right? it's just, uh, not, not, not to like, focus on what we're building, it's basically the base layer. And it, it, it's actually more of a UX issue. Like, if you don't want your user to use wrapped air or whatever, you can build tools around it um, on a UX level that they don't have. Um, and with stuff like meta transactions, all sorts of things, you can get quite far with not even knowing this. Martin, what do you think about this idea of uh, having this, this special contract which gives an ERC-20 interface over E, but basically you wouldn't need to transfer your money into it because it could, it could handle what I can't. I don't know. Sounds I need to think about this some more to have a say about it. So I kind of, I don't know, I like, in the first view I don't like this idea of having like special like addresses. I mean like on technical point of view, like you would need like a map of these somehow maintained and they will, dif will differ on different hard forms, right? Pre-compiled versions too. Yeah, but at least pre-compiled has like, like more or less known the, the address range. And just 16 and higher on the <laughs> But I understand we will not like, or you want to like deploy it on like given address, or like you just deploy it regularly and just mark this one as a subsidized somehow. <coughs> so this well, it's one like too technical and yeah, this it's one, not the point to go there. Um, yeah, this one would be probably a pre-compiled because it has to have control over the, the, the users. Ah, okay, yeah, it was actually more than a pre-compiled, it's a new thing. There was going to be a block hash, right, system contract, but it never... But this is even more invasive than that. I want to bring back a very, very old question. Why pre-compiles and not opcodes? Maybe do you want to just finish this? Right, right, sorry. No, I was done. <laughs> we don't have to. Uh, you just reminded me of, of something. Why is it that, um, like inside the EVM, I can't look back more than two hundred fifty-six block hashes? Because um, the light clients wouldn't be able to mm -hmm. uh, execute mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. I think is the main reason. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I, I mean, it's it's a pretty random uh, number, though. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that was a pretty bad. But it had even light clients, as far as I know, download all the headers. That doesn't verify everyone, maybe like one in every 1024 or something. Mm -hmm. Just a random number, just Yeah, I mean, it could have been a bit higher. Yeah, it could be a lot higher. A lot higher, yeah. Because yeah. it's very little data, right? Yeah. So your question on why not upcodes and why pre compiles? I think even the, the initial set of frequent files like the identity, the shared to five six, right, and the along with Kachak, all of those were uploads. And then those except Kachak were moved out to this new concept of frequent files. Kachak I believe was left because <coughs> it would be more often used. Um, but maybe you, you, no, I don't think you were around. Maybe you were around. I wonder <coughs> but I, I really don't know. Like except obviously the address space issue of like the opcodes, but at the end, how many precompiles do we have now? Nine. So what would be the benefit having them as opcodes? And uh, well, we have only one. We only have opcodes. We don't have to like write additional call code. So that's what that's why. Uh, so for me, like. <coughs> uh, exhausting the, the opcode space, it's not, I don't know. Maybe the so it, it's, 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 it might be actually a deal, because 
it might be very difficult to have to bite uh, opcodes later on. Yes, that, that would be painful, I think. Yeah, that would like, still serious like, problems with that. But it also I, brings the question is like, why do we run cream on files and we <coughs> opcodes? Like, where do we draw that line? Yeah, I, I don't so, know, I'm so, asking so, this because like, I'm not on, sure. the, on this point, I'm not like very <laughs> much concerned. But I, I, so far I believe like that's not the issue at all, but I think I, I was corrected, it actually is. So we still have like one byte to use. Uh, but, well, there's a way to work around it, or this a bit ugly way. Uh, but like from like uh, API point of view, I mean like VM implementation. So actually it's, it's actually easy for me to implement pre in VM because I don't have to do it at all. Because like it's, <laughs> it's another call, so like the client has to handle that somehow. So like the client will not, I will just inform the client there's a call to, to handle, and the client will figure out it's actually pre-compiled less. And will, like, so the calls of the, of the pre-compile is on the client side, not on the VM side. This like in the API I'm using. And I, I actually need to have like Ketchak implementation and like shift with the EVM. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, but that's arbitrary. This, this, uh, it's it's kind of right? Yeah, yeah, someone has to do it. And the yeah. advantages that you have to do it again is like you can ship a single CEVM and we can integrate it in multiple clients, for instance. Yeah. yeah. So like EVMC would be just like a single module, right? And we know it, we don't. Yeah, I actually prefer like smaller module, but like I would like yeah. to it. But yeah. But you know, like. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's not like yeah, it's a strict just, boundary. Like we cannot cross that, yeah. but. It's so just, far it's easier. It's yeah, it's just a question I'm always. I wasn't 100% sure as to like, how do we know we should make it an opcode, how do we know we should make it this, and yeah, I was just like, curious. About the opcode space, there's this interesting uh, EIP, old one from Gavin, to instead of having like... Int call? Yeah, exactly. Instead of having um, six, you know, 16 different types of calls, you have one, and then there's, it becomes a parameter of what kind of call you want uh, to right. do. So that would reduce the... Hot code, <laughs> <Hot> code space, <coughs> free open space. And it would go into the same problems with analysis, finding out what kind of a call is being yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm okay with adding more calls, if that makes sense. It doesn't have to weird way of, of, of uh, passing parameters to that. Um, so, while you were talking about EVM1, there was a question. Whether <coughs> there are any other optimizations to do apart from what you explained in the morning? Uh, yeah, there are a number of them, but they are kind of like like regular engineering jobs. So this, like, I don't know if I can even list that. Uh, but yeah, pre-allocate stack up front. <laughs> <laughs> that is like obvious one. But yeah, we do that. I think it's yeah. so. I think these are like two like two two things that is worth mentioning, and the rest is like playing with the code, doing benchmark, micro benchmarks, like changing something and see if it's faster or not. Uh, so yeah, you can actually read uh, chain block because I try to list them uh, when they appear. So. I cannot mention anything right now, like, out of my head. So Martin, since you're here, <coughs> I'm not sure if you've seen a table CVM1 or EVM optimization. Yeah. Uh, what is GoEthereum using from those techniques? Uh, so I think, as far as I understand, the main cool thing is that he does a bit of look ahead and walking in the paths and calculating the gas. Yeah. That's pre calculates. Yeah, you can simplify the, the gas cost of the block of instructions. Yeah. But you can also uh, pre calculate the stack, stack requirements. requirements. Yeah. And High work marks and lower. So I, I thought it's the most important one, but actually it's not. I mean, so yeah. I think it's good news. Like the integer implementation is. Like we actually changed the integer implementation in Aleph from boost to int, int x. And it's like three times faster now. Yeah. So I think that's not controversial change, right? 
it just it's, it's an optimization. So yeah, I think we should finish writing. your work and go on that. So. Martin, were you writing a new uh, big integer library? I did, yes. And it is definitely faster than the big int library, but in practice it doesn't make any difference. Kind of. Did it didn't make any difference? I mean, no, because, I mean, even if you make uh, 10 times faster, if the arithmetic, if the like, contribution of the arithmetic ops to the actual execution time is only this portion. It doesn't matter. This is ten times faster. Oh, so you were benchmarking it against like the full sync, yeah? Is that right. So, but if you run a numerical benchmark just in computational app codes, you would see a big speed up. Yes. Okay. So if you would uh, if you would apply those changes, and hypothetically we could reprice those as we discussed it a few times already, op codes. Mm -hmm. Then could we get rid of some of the frequent parts? <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. In the backward way, I don't think so. I don't know. Do, do we want to get rid of frequent parts? I don't know. That was the thing. Well, I guess you can actually get rid of them, but you could stop new ones. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought not having to recompile is quite a big thing that we've discussed, I think, at length and multiple times. Not, not in this discussion, but mm -hmm. over the Ideally, you want people to be able to like write a new crypto function and not have yeah, to yeah. rely on the, the, the client devs to integrate it for you. Yeah, they're against the Ethereum class, <coughs> in my opinion. Against what? Yeah, like, it's a, <laughs> let's face it, it's a company against, against what? Tree compiles, they like, go against the Ethereum class. So, not in general. Yes and no, because it's a bailout for somebody's hash function. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it's unfortunately like that, but then I also sometimes feel like we're building almost like a CPU, and CPUs have specific things that they're good at. Like, you know, you have some instruction sets that you make available. You could compare it to that as well. So I have like a polarizing, depend, well, depends how you get on the day. So the main problem with, okay, one of the problems with pre is people just want to have these features and now they have to to wait, uh, so they cannot do many of these things on the EVM today. So that's now fair. they have to wait that's for fair. somebody to propose it and be lucky to be accepted, and then go into a hard fork at some point in time, yeah. and be unsure whether it goes into the hard fork two weeks before the hard fork happens. Yeah. Um, okay, so you made some benchmarks, um, and I think you made some benchmarks for some existing pre files, maybe some proposed ones, mm -hmm. but are there any ones which with like EVM1, uh, are there any ones which could be just done on EVM with EVM1 without having those pre compiles? Were there any such cases? Oh well, yeah, like 2 b was definitely do it on EVM1 if it was... Well, I mean, the thing is we have to um, be careful about how we're metering, you know, those new hot codes and so we don't yet have the, the studies done to show that we can safely um, meter them and get the full speed up, so that's it's going to depend on, on that. But if we're optimistic, then yeah, I think it would, it's benchmark show would be sufficient to replace the free compile. But uh, I'm not certain. I don't know if I understood it correctly. But what I meant to ask was, did you in a way did you check where the gas went in that? Uh, implementing for example the HP, if the gas went to computational ones or if it went into the memory shuffling of data and the handling of it? No, so we haven't done any gas analysis. We just did the um, you know runtime benchmark for runtime on EVM1 and then said, okay, well this is way less than 100 milliseconds, so yeah. it should cost less than you know eight million gas or whatever. But that assumes we can, you know, optimistically price op codes and that there are worst case runtimes in EVM1 somewhere where we have to be more conservative with how we price them. Alright guys, I think there's the time limit actually. You have a short question? Uh, <laughs> a very short question. Um, just like to benchmark these different EVM implementations, um, how do you guys have control for other things like the attention performance? So if 
things like, say, like, you know, uh, the machine's uh, power profile. So, um, you know, on Windows, your high performance, high performance will affect things like OK CPU for parking and kind of things like that. Um, and then other programs are running at the same time and all those things related to well, which can affect power. So, <clears throat> I, can, I can explain how I do it, but it's not actually a short answer, so. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, well, I'm running on the same machine, right? And, uh, and there is a way to, well, actually I will just restart machine, there are only this one process of benchmarking. You can also pin some calls, I mean, at least in Linux you can like, separate some uh, calls and run process only on these calls and ask kernel to move everything, other tasks to other calls. And this, I think a lot of the documentation and uh, a page in documentation that describes many of these tricks. You can disable uh, turbo turbo frequencies, so it runs on the like base one, which for my laptop make it like four times slower, <laughs> but still like refer like relevant like yeah uh, like we we we're mostly interested in in, in like uh, differences, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. What, uh, and. There's like many other things, but I also like check the, the, the variation or like standard deviation of that, which like my tool reports. And like even if running with like browser open, it's like it, it gets maybe around 1%, uh, but with all these tricks, and some of them actually doesn't matter from my experience, it's, it goes, I mean, I'll show how to, I, I have trouble with interpreting the standard variation, but it's like, one well, it's one times uh, one thousand times slower than the, the values. Uh, so I think it's more or less pretty stable. Uh, although like EVM benchmarking is difficult, it's like a lot of going on. It's like it's not like really. I think it's on the boundary of micro benchmarking. I think because there's memory usage and memory allocations happening. So. There's some other different things, but in general, if you have EVM code that runs long enough, I think it's good, good, good uh, measurement. And that's the easy case. The hard case is when you start <coughs> dealing with the I/O operations. Yeah, that's I'm not like benchmarking at all. <laughs> so thank you for all uh, discussion. Thank you. Uh, let's finish this session.